Good afternoon, everyone. We are very, very happy to have uh, Jamie Sally from UBC this afternoon to tell us about sharp holography for boundaries and brains. So, Jamie, please take it away. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I'd like to tell you today about uh, two different papers uh, that I worked on, one from last year with uh, Mark Van Ramstock and David Wakeham, and then another paper that's uh, not quite finished, but it's getting there, uh, with Wyatt Reeves, Moshe Rosali, Peter uh, Smidja. I'm gonna, I did a bad job with his last name. I'm gonna have to apologize to him later today. Uh, Chris Waddell and David Wakeham. So let's begin with a, a little bit of motivation and uh, kind of an old question. Uh, you know, a question that people have been asking for the last 20 years is, uh, when does a CFT have a good bulk dual? That is, when are CFT correlators well described by uh, semi-classical gravitational effective field theory, that is, you know, with a weakly coupled Einstein gravity? Uh, and there was a, now I think an oldish conjecture that, you know, there a set of necessary and sufficient conditions would be first, a large C factorization, that is, you know, you took a four point function and it's given by the product of two point functions plus some connected component that is, you know, one over C suppressed. And this was meant to be the sort of uh, CFT dual of the perturbative effective field theory in the bulk. And the other condition was that uh, you needed some sort of single trace gap or, or sparseness. And so some sort of pictorial representation of the spectrum of the CFT should look like this where sort of at low energies, you just have uh, a few single trace operators uh, and they're sort of multi-trace uh, composite operators, which are meant to be the sort of low energy fields and the gravitational theory and, and all of their sort of uh, multi-particle states. And then up here, you have all these uh, black hole states. And possibly in between, you know, there's some other regime where there's a gap with some sort of uh, more dense spectrum, although not too dense of sort of stringy excitations. And so if you had this large C factorization and these sparseness conditions, then it was conjectured that these were necessary and sufficient to have a, a good uh, gravitational effective field theory. And the evidence for this conjecture generally followed from two approaches. The first sort of set of approaches was using entanglement or quantum information. And the prototypical example of this is the, the, per, the work of Hartman. Uh, and there, you know, he used agreement between the RT formula and the bulk uh, and calculations of entanglement entropy in the CFT to constrain the CFT. As he looked in a 2D CFT and looked at, say, the entanglement uh, entropy of two intervals, uh, two disjoint intervals at here A and B. And in gravity, uh, the entropy was meant to be either uh, this minimal surface or this minimal surface. So it was the, the leading order, these two minimal surfaces. And so it was, there's some uh, phase transition between these two phases. And in order to have that occur in the CFT, you find that it constrains the density of states of the CFT. Uh, another set of approaches uses the conformal bootstrap. And a prototypical example is uh, this uh, early work of HPPS, um, where you count all of the perturbative solutions that are you know, perturbative about the, the mean field theory uh, solution to crossing, and compare the counting of these solutions to crossing with say, uh, the counting of all the possible local interactions in the bulk. And in that working was found there's an exact agreement in counting CFT solutions and bulk interactions. Uh, this is something that I wanted to call sort of sharp holography, showing that there was sort of a, uh, an exact match between uh, gravitational effective field theory and, and solutions to crossing in the CFT, given the, the two uh, uh, assumptions in the, the previous slide. Of course, there's much related work to this that followed on later and uh, all sorts of other sort of bootstrappy large end tests of, of this conjecture. In particular, you know, those that probe not just the example I gave above of the sort of uh, effective fields in the ADS background, but also probing the gravitational sector and showing that it really is uh, Einstein gravity that one gets. Uh, but this work really sort of focused, I'd say, on sort of local properties of the theory, you know, local interactions and, and sort of local semi-classical fields. Uh, but CFTs also have many long non-local deformations, including defects and boundaries. So you can imagine you take your CFT and you insert, say, some defect operator uh, of some lower co-dimension. So it could be you know, a, a line operator or some co-dimension one brain. Uh, 
you know, if it's a code dimension one operator, you know, these are often seen as interfaces that can take you from on one CFT on one side to another CFT on the other. And of course, uh, one sort of special case of these are, are boundary operators where you have a, a CFT on one side and then you completely gap the theory on the other side. Uh, and so in the infrared, you just have a, a CFT that ends on a boundary. Uh, so these are known as boundary conformal field theories and these are what I'm gonna focus on in the talk today. Uh, and so the question is, what does the bulk picture look like when we insert one of these boundary operators in the CFT? Um, for CFTs that have a good bulk dual, it was conjectured by Takinagi that a, a BACFD would be dual to a bulk geometry with an end of the world brain. So here's the CFT, here's the boundary, and then sort of coming out from that boundary into the bulk is some end of the world brain. Uh, we know though this is not the complete story. Uh, top-down microscopic constructions have shown that, you know, there's often some sort of higher dimensional geometry that caps off smoothly without a brain. So instead of the sort of end of the brain picture at every slice, you could imagine here is some slice of the bulk geometry at every point, say there is some higher dimensional manifold, the circle that I draw here. And as we go deeper into the bulk, that circle just kind of pinches off smoothly. And that's how the space-time ends, it just sort of caps off. And so, uh, the question that I'd like to ask in this talk, the, my sort of big question uh, overarching these two papers that I'm going to talk about is, uh, when does a BCFT have a description in terms of a, some set of semi-classical bulk gravity? It could be bulk gravity that has a localized end of the world brain or otherwise just sort of caps off smoothly. And the types of answers to this question you might sort of think fall in some sort of sparseness continuum. So it could be that a, a CFT with a good bulk dual uh, any associated boundary condition for that CFT results in a, a good bulk description of that BCFT. It could be that some or many associated of the BCFTs to that CFT have good bulk duals, or it could be that even if you know, your, your CFT has a good bulk dual, it's, it's the case that almost no associated uh, boundary conditions, no associated BCFTs have good bulk duals, and these are very rare and sparse things. Uh, why care about this question? Uh, I think there's many good reasons, but here are a few I like. Uh, one sort of a recent interest is that BCFTs have been nice models of sort of Euclidean wormholes and islands. So they, they see it as good sort of ways to take a gravitational system here thought of as this brain dual to the boundary and coupling it to an external system, which is the bulk CFT. Uh, Another, I think, interesting question is asking how much does a gravitational system have to look like string theory? So you know, asking, does any CFT with a good bulk dual also have a, a well-behaved spectrum of, you know, or a spectrum of well-behaved brains? So are, are all these sort of operators that I insert, do they, they also have a nice gravitational description, which would, so, you know, you might say makes the theory something like a string theory. Uh, so I'm gonna follow, again, these same two approaches to answering this question. So uh, using entanglement, we can repeat an analogous computation uh, that Hartman did, but in this case for 2D BCFTs. And here for a single interval in a 2D BCFT, there's again a phase transition in the entanglement entropy between uh, some connected RT surface for this interval and some disconnected RT surface for the interval. Uh, and in order to match the, the correct phase transition in gravity to get these two phases, uh, it requires a certain sparseness constraints on the spectrum of the BCFT, which do not seem to be required in general. And then second approach, which is the sort of second paper that I mentioned, uh, again, was sort of more of a bootstrappy approach or although at, the, at this point, the sort of what we've done is maybe not quite a, a true bootstrap calculation. Uh, so you can set up to replicate this work of HPPS and all the successes for a BCFT. But you find there's already non-trivial constraints at leading order. So these follow from thinking about the causal structure of the bulk. And they're relevant whenever a BCFT has a good bulk dual, not just the sort of naive end of the world brain proposal of Takinagi. Uh, and thinking about these is a little bit like the BCFT analog of the sort of older work of Maldacena et al looking for a bulk point. So what we find is that at leading order, the causal structure of the bulk places extremely restrictive constraints on the BCFT spectrum. And the conclusion that we'll get to is that the, the space of good bulk boundary conditions for a CFT is, I'd say, sort of even more sparse than the space of CFTs with good bulk tools. 
And so I think our, the conclusion we'll reach is that, or that I'll argue for is that a, a BCFT almost never has a good bulk dual. Uh, so the outline of the talk, first I'm gonna go to sort of a quick lightning review of boundary conformal field theory. And then uh, we'll talk about the sort of uh, entanglement uh, approach. So we'll talk, I call this BCFT entanglement to be a large central charge in homage to uh, Hartman's earlier paper. And the uh, next part we'll do is bootstrappy approach, which we'll call looking for a bulk brain, although not finding one uh, in homage to this, the Malvasina paper. Uh, any questions uh, so far about where we're going? Nope. Oh, hey, David. Okay. Um, actually, yeah. um, let me maybe, uh, you're probably gonna, gonna come to that. Um, but, but I was wondering when I looked at your picture um, about this Hartmann-like computation and the RT surfaces you want to consider then, Usually there's, well, usually one wants to, to have a BCFT with a dual description where you would say that your defect um, or the, the boundary of your CFT is sort of coupled to a lower dimensional CFT, which has a large, a very large number of um, degrees of freedom. And that more or less corresponds to the brain. Um, really not sitting too close to the asymptotic boundary, but sort of bending the other way. Um, and then you would have sort of like potentially issues finding this connected phase um, easily. So I was, I was just wondering whether, well, what you're doing is sort of like general, or do, do, you, um, do you make some assumptions about sort of like having a large number of degrees of freedom at your defect? So in, in this story, the boundary entropy will be a free parameter. Okay. So, the, yeah, the, these constraints will have to hold uh, sort of no matter what your boundary entropy is. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any other questions before I go on? Okay, let's just go through sort of a lightning review of boundary conformal field theory. If, in case anyone hasn't uh, thought very much about it, just to kind of go over some of the basic facts that I will start using in the rest of the talk. Um, so to define a, a CFT on a half space, say the upper half plane or some half sphere, some disc, uh, we had to choose boundary conditions at the, at the endpoints or at the, at the, the boundary. Uh, in the infrared, we expect these boundary conditions to flow to conformally invariant boundary conditions, each of which defines some boundary conformal field theory. Uh, the symmetries of the theory preserve some SOD1 uh, in the SOD plus 1, 1 in, of the Euclidean theory. Yeah, it's good to remember that the symmetries that it preserves are not ones that just act on the boundary itself. There's some subset of the ones acting uh, in the entire sort of bulk as well. So here I've drawn some sort of schematic picture of the dilation operator, which is, you know, it dilates along the boundary, but also dilates you into the bulk as well. So it's sort of the higher dimensional dilation operator that's preserved. Uh, the state operator map. Uh, because we have a dilation operator, we have a mapping between BCFT states on the disk and boundary operators that live on some point on the boundary. And so we can use the state operator map to build some sort of boundary operator expansion where we take some uh, bulk operator and we sort of evolve it back to the boundary and expand it in terms of some uh, infinite series of operators that live on the boundary itself. These operators that live on the boundary are, you know, they're, they're different operators from a different spectrum of operators than the operators that live in the bulk of the CFT. Uh, in terms of correlation functions, scalar bulk operators can have non vanishing one point functions. These are allowed by the symmetries. So they are just given by some constant uh, over the, the distance from the boundary to the appropriate power. Uh, bulk two point functions are no longer fixed by kinematics. So here I've uh, written down an expression for the sort of general bulk two-point function of two operators. Here written in terms of some arbitrary unknown function, g of c, where c is some cross ratio that can be constructed out of these two bulk points. Uh, most of these correlators you can think are examples uh, of a kinematic doubling trick. That is, we sort of want to understand the kinematics of the problem. Instead of thinking about the two points, sometimes it's helpful to sort of double the theory across the boundary. And so 
uh, you'll see like the one point function looks a little bit like a bulk two point function and uh, the, the two point function looks a little bit like a, a bulk four point function. So this is not a, a dynamical uh, statement at all. There's no uh, you know, four point function that you're actually calculating. It's just some uh, way to understand the kinematics of the problem. Uh, I'm going to find it convenient throughout this talk to work with two different cross ratios at times, uh, partly because they're easier and partly because I'm combining some different works and I didn't want to have to uh, rewrite all the formulas, so I apologize. Uh, so there's this cross ratio C and another one uh, which is related to it, I'll call it eta. And so there's some limit where C goes to zero and eta goes to one, which is just when uh, the two points in the bulk approach each other. And another limit when C goes to infinity and eta goes to zero, which is sort of an opposite uh, limit where they uh, approach the boundary. Uh, just like we have the bulk bootstrap, there is a, a boundary bootstrap that we can uh, expand a bulk two-point function using either the regular bulk OPE or this new sort of boundary operator expansion. And equating these two expansions of the two-point function gives us some bootstrap equations. So in the bulk channel, we take the two operators, we fuse them into a sum of bulk operators, and then we take their expectation value uh, on the boundary. Uh, these are how we could have construct. And then the, the bulk blocks obviously sum over all the operators in uh, one uh, bulk uh, family. And then there's a, a boundary channel expansion where we uh, fuse the operators into the boundary. We do the boundary OPE and then take the two-point functions on the boundary. And these gives us uh, boundary conformal blocks. And so then here is the statement of uh, the sort of uh, boundary bootstrap equation, which equates these two expansions to each other. Uh, now, holographic BCFDs uh, from the remaining uh, symmetries of the boundary conformal field theory, we can write the most general bulk solution in this form. Uh, here, what we really see is we have some sort of uh, ADSD, some sort of lower dimensional ADSD slicing uh, with some warp factor and then say some internal space. Uh, one remark about this is that what it means is that there's no unique vacuum uh, for the BCFT. We can't, it's not determined by symmetries alone. We have these arbitrary functions, F of mu. Uh, of course, without internal dimensions, we can write it in this way, where it has this picture where we have the CFT, we have these ADSD slices. Uh, here is this sort of mu radial direction, and then it ends on some end of the world brain. Uh, when f of mu is just Cauchy squared, this is just some wedge of the ADS vacuum here that ends on this brain. Uh, as always, boundary conformal field theories in 2D behave slightly different than D greater than two. So we can view the boundary condition as uh, prepared by a state. And so, you know, correlation functions of operators uh, with boundary condition, say B, we can view as sort of overlaps of some state with some boundary state B. Uh, and an important overlap we'll care about is the boundary entropy, which is just related to the overlap of the vacuum with the boundary state. That is, you know, just calculating the disk partition function of the boundary CFT. Uh, the simplest 2D bulk dual we can imagine is just assuming the uh, ADS vacuum everywhere ending on this constant tension brain. Uh, the radial coordinate of this brain is determined by uh, okay, the tension of the brain. Uh, and so you can relate, uh, you can compute this vacuum overlap, you can compute the disk partition function, and then you can relate this parameter on the previous slide, the sort of boundary entropy log G to the tension of the brain. Okay, and I think this will be the last little bit of um, review. So the sort of doubling trick we talked about also uh, works nicely with the Virasoro symmetry. So in addition to the global symmetries that are preserved, we can ask which are the Virasoro generators that map the upper half plane uh, back to itself. And it's this particular linear combination, LN plus LN bar. And when we look at the uh, ward identity given by these, we see we have you know, contributions both as you'd expect from uh, the chiral part, but also we have contributions from the antichiral part because we've uh, included LN bar. 
And so a, a nice way to interpret this word identity uh, is that you just have a chiral CFT on the whole plane that we take our correlation function uh, where we have operators you know, at a point ZZ bar, and then we just sort of break it into two pieces, some uh, chiral piece at Z, and we flip the Z bar piece across the boundary into the lower half plane and pretend like there's another chiral operator uh, that lives there. And so this gives us also uh, some sort of Virasoro bootstrap. So we can, some chiral bootstrap equations where we just expand now in terms of uh, the Virasoro conformal blocks, both on the boundary and the bulk. So that is my lightning review of some basic facts of BCFT that we're going to put to work. Um, any questions about that before we dive into things? Uh, I have a quick question. In principle, even in higher dimensions, you should be able to think of boundary conditions as a boundary state and think of a notion of boundary entropy. You could think of it as a state, but it's not, wouldn't be the typical quantization where we, we think about, we usually quantize higher dimensional CFTs on the sphere. And this is our usual state operator mapping, et cetera. Um, yes. you know, it, but the boundary is, does not have the topology of a, a sphere in higher dimensions. I see. And so yes. it would be some unusual quantization of a theory where you would be, you know, the states would correspond to things like um, I guess, yeah, I guess you know the states would live on some annulus, and your your operators that you'd be interested in would be the operators. They would be, yeah, okay, they'd be higher dimensional operators. I see. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. So, what is the entanglement entropy of a interval in, in a, yeah, uh, but I, I think I should also just say, um, as I mentioned before, you know, this, this uh, calculation I'm going to discuss now is, is sort of very indebted to, to Hartman's earlier work. So I won't add citations throughout to him, but I'll just give one big citation here at the beginning. Uh, so what is the entanglement entropy of an interval in a 2D holographic BCFT? Uh, well, we just use the usual RT formula like in a normal CFT, except now the RT surface can end on the boundary brain. And so as we briefly discussed in the uh, introduction, uh, one possible RT surface is this connected one, which looks similar just to the RT surface for an interval in a normal CFT. But we also have this other disconnected RT surface that's allowed where, they, where this, the RT surface ends on the boundary brain. Um, for an arbitrary BCFT, the connected area will depend on the radial warp factor. Uh, so this RT surface, its area is not universal. On the other hand, this one is universal. It's, de it's determined just in terms of the boundary entropy. So uh, if we want an answer that's universal in both phases, if we want to sort of calculate without trying to dig into the, the details of the BCFD, what we can do is assume that our BCFD has a bulk dual that's just a wedge of ADS plus some constant tension brain. And if we make that assumption, then both of these will be universal. So in the connected phase, the entanglement entropy is just the same entanglement entropy for an interval in a normal CFT. And then the, in the disconnected phase, uh, the entanglement entropy is determined just by this boundary entropy here. And so the, the total answer then is just you know, the minimum of, of these two, that there's uh, these two phases and a phase transition between them. So we can attempt to reproduce uh, this calculation now directly in the uh, boundary conformal field theory. So we're going to use uh, the standard replica trick. So we'll calculate the entanglement entropy as a limit as n goes to one of some uh, Renyi entropies. And we're going to calculate the Renyi entropies uh, using uh, twist operators. So we'll think that say here this, you know, we gave some example of some uh, the Renyi three entropy. And here we'll think of it in terms of some insertion of two twist operators that uh, glue these sheets together. So important difference from uh, maybe standard CFT techniques is that twist operators do not need to be paired with an anti-twist operator. So we can think about a twist operator being inserted here in the BCFT and we can think about the cut 
that comes from that twist operator as going and ending on the boundary. And if you like the sort of doubling perspective, that makes sense in that you can imagine there's sort of an anti-twist operator on the other side, and this cut is sort of going all the way through and ending on that uh, sort of mirrored anti-twist operator. Uh, so what this means is that the twist operator has an expectation value in a BCFT, it has a one point function. To calculate that, we think about this twist operator just as sort of cutting some small epsilon hole uh, and then gluing together uh, multiple sheets. And so what I'm seeing is just, I'll just define this twist operator with some sort of size of a hole it cuts and some uh, implicit um, boundary condition associated to it, some boundary A. And then when I glue them all together, the answer is just uh, some cylinder with some boundary condition A on one end and a boundary condition B on the other. And so the expectation value is just this quantity here. It depends on the boundary of the CFT, of sort of the size of the cut, and as well as A. But I, I'm going to just sort of I take this other boundary condition and I, I just absorb it into the, the notion of my cutoff, which I use to define that twist operator. So what you then find is that in the limit where either eta goes to zero or one, uh, the twist operator two-point function is easy to calculate. What we do is just take the leading identity term in either the OPE or the BOE channel. So the limit eta goes to zero, I'm in the uh, BOE uh, limit. So here I just replace this two-point function by the product of the two one-point functions. That's what happens when I fuse to the identity in that channel. And the limit eta goes to one, I'm in the bulk OPE channel and I just uh, replace this with the CFT expectation value. And that's what happens when I just take the identity component in that channel. And so if you calculate the product of these two, the product of the two expectation values of the CFT, we get exactly these two uh, phases we wanted. That is, eta goes to zero, we get this disconnected piece. The disconnected piece is really, it's disconnected because it's the product of these two one-point functions. And then we get this, the regular connected uh, answer in the other channel when eta goes to one. So this is in agreement with holographic results in these limits. The less trivial part is that we want to understand uh, when this holds for all eta with a, a sharp phase transition between the two limits. So not just as eta goes to zero or eta goes to one, but really for all, all eta. So the full expression of the two point function is this. I've just written it in the two channels. So here is the uh, expansion in terms of Vera Soro blocks in the boundary channel and the expansion in terms of uh, Vera Soro blocks in the bulk channel. Sorry, can I, can I stop yeah. you and dra drag you back? Just a quick question. Um, the, for the boundary entropy that you get from this calculation, is it clear how it's uh, expressed in terms of the, you know, the CFT data? So the, the various coefficients, both of the bu <coughs> bulk Safety bulk to boundary expansion and of the you know all the CIJKs and the dimensions and the dimensions of stuff that lives on the boundary. Like, is it clear what how how is the boundary entropy expressed in terms of those things? Yeah, um, so the boundary entropy is one of the parameters that defines the BCFT. But uh, isn't it uh, the case that the BCFT is completely defined? You know, like in just in the same way that the regular CFT is defined in terms of the CIJKs and the conformal uh, Yeah, so, so the, the, then you say that the boundary entropy is related to the density of states in the BCFT at, at a large dimension. So you can think about it as some correction. So we, we know there's the regular Cardi formula and this says, you know, in a, in a BCFT, you got the Cardi formula plus some sort of subleading correction or well, you, you get plus some correction, some constant correction. And that's exactly what this boundary entropy is. So it is, it, it's some, you know, you should think of it very analogously to C, which is, which you can think about in the Cardi format as sort of something that tells you about the large dimension density of states. So in, a, in the BCFT, uh, G is telling you is a parameter like C, which tells you about the large dimension density of states. Is that helpful? Um, um, a little bit, maybe I can ask you at the end for some more, okay. but uh, it's okay. Sounds good, thanks. Uh, yeah, so we were saying we had these two uh, expansions in terms of uh, Virasoro blocks in either channel. Uh, and we know that in the semi-classical C goes to infinity limit, 
these chiral conformable blocks and so that they become classical and they're semi-classical and exponentiate in terms of some function uh, f. Uh, and especially for light operators, if we the internal dimension is sort of uh, less than order c, then we can uh, write this uh, classical conformable block in terms of some function that doesn't depend on the internal dimension at all. So that allows us to sort of separate out in this uh, expansion, the contribution of either light and heavy operators. So I've done that here. I've grouped all of the light operators in both channels together and then written their Vera Soto blocks just in terms of some fixed function. So here, you know, DL is the sum of all the OBE coefficients for the light operators and here in the boundary channel and here in the, the bulk channel. And then here are the remaining sort of heavy operators. Uh, so the answer we want that it's given sort of just by this uh, sort of leading uh, identity, this leading vacuum piece follows from what's been known as vacuum block dominance. That is uh, the heavy and all these additional light operators that I'm summing over here are all suppressed for all eta uh, in one channel or the other so that the leading answer is given by the, the vacuum contribution alone. Of course, it's, I should just say, it, it may not be necessary that all renews are determined by vacuum block dominance and I guess work uh, by Alex Belen and collaborators also so show, showed that it may not be always be, may not always be true. Um, so how do we show the heavy operators are suppressed? Uh, well, it's hard to derive the sort of maybe the, the strongest possible form of this constraint, but we can try to show a weaker constraint that heavy operators are suppressed in a, a neighborhood about the endpoints. So we can use the uh, expansion and eta of the semi-classical blocks uh, to see that these blocks are suppressed by some log eta term. Uh, and so this term here will exponentially suppress uh, in C these, the, the contribution of all of these operators unless that is the sum over the BOE coefficients or, or the, the sort of VEVs in the other channel grows too quickly to compensate. And so to make sure that doesn't happen then we can just say near eta that we have a constraint here I sort of here, this is sort of the, the density of operators and the, the so think about this as sort of the, the, the density of the operators times their uh, BOE coefficients, that this is constrained to grow sort of uh, less than delta, that is some, some number of order C times uh, log eta. Um, so here, you know, obviously this constraint gets stronger that, it, you know, it's, it's a stronger constraint and eta gets larger. But of course, this is just a, a perturbative expansion in eta. And so, you know, we can't derive the, we, we'd like to say get the strongest constraint at, at, at the, as we take eta larger, but because this is just perturbative, we don't actually know exactly what the constraint is. And so this constraint is sort of uh, only uh, rigorous when eta is small. And likewise, you can do it in the other channel as well. So we get a constraint on the density of operators times here, the product of their uh, expectation values and their regular bulk OPE coefficients. And again, it's constrained to, to grow less than something that's sort of order C times uh, some number that we get from eta. Uh, for the light operators, what we want so we don't change the leading coefficients is that the sum over all of the uh, BOE coefficients has to be less than order E to the C. Uh, in order for a calculation to work, we need this in both channels. So we need it to be true for both the BOE coefficients as well as the OPE coefficients times the expectation values of those operators. Uh, but only this first condition uh, will be taken as a constraint for all BCFTs. That's because as we sort of said at the beginning, um, that the disconnected phase must exist universally. So the thing that only sort of depends on the theory is where that phase boundary ends. That is when does the, the connected phase become dominant. And so we will always need this constraint to be true, uh, but it's not the case that uh, we always get the sort of vacuum answer. We always get the bulk CFT answer uh, in the other phase. And so uh, this you know, condition need not be true and sort of necessarily will be broken in CFTs. Uh, and you know, sort of an obvious example is, is when sort of simple operators have order C VEVs turned on, we expect the sort of background to, uh, to back react to those VEVs that are turned on. And so we expect that this will change the answer. Uh, 
Uh, the constraints that I just mentioned are really constraints on the orbifold theory because we're calculating twist operator correlation functions. But of course, for every n, you can then relate the constraints and the orbifold theory to constraints on sort of the base theory on the, on the BCFT that we really care about. You know, in particular, in, for n equals 2, the DOE coefficients in the orbifold theory are term, determined in terms of the boundary two-point function. And so the nice part about that is that they're then universal. So here, uh, this product of uh, the DOE coefficients for the, the second uh, so the, the twist operator are just given by you know, 16 to the minus two delta i, where this is the scaling dimension of some BOE operator. And so what we then do is we can take our constraint on the orbifold BOE uh, coefficients and relate this then to some constraint on the sum of uh, operator dimensions that are on, on the density of states in the, the base theory. So what we find is that you know, these uh, the light operators can't grow too quickly in the BCFT. We can't have too many of them in order to have uh, agreement with the bulk uh, RT calculation. So uh, that is where I just will well, leave this uh, first earlier paper. Uh, any questions on that before we continue on? Yeah, I have a question about the, your last formula. Okay. I was thinking, can you make more comments on, on this formula? Because you see on the left side is like a summation of things and it's yeah. initial suppressed. And on the right side is exponential growth with the center charge. Yes. With the heavy operator. So how can you use this to like to confine which, which theory is um, good here, which theory is bad? I mean, what, what this is going to rule out is, you know, some, you know, in, in particular, one thing I will rule out is where uh, the density of states for uh, light operators grows, say, like e to the c. Hmm. So that's I mean, that's sort of the obvious. Uh, I mean, and you can try to fudge the numbers a little bit by you know how exactly it's growing. But I mean, the, the sort of the basic the basic constraint is that uh, this calculation would fail if you had order e to the c light operators. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions about this part? OK, I'll continue on. So let's move on to looking for a bulk brain. Uh, so the, the bootstrap approach for conformal field theories begins with you know, a perturbative expansion around the mean field theory or the, you know, the generalized free field solution. That is, if we take some four-point function and then it's given by some universal mean field theory calculation of that four point function plus corrections that are order one over C. Um, and here the leading contribution is universal because the mean field theory uh, four point function is determined just in terms of the universal CFT two point function. And so you know, this expansion is valid and makes sense because the bulk vacuum solution is also universal, it's unique. Uh, but as we've said a few times, the BCFT vacuum solution is not universal, that there's many different uh, BCFT solutions that are compatible with the, with the sort of uh, unbroken symmetry. And so, uh, you know, in the bulk picture, we, we believe all these deformations are allowed. And so if we were to calculate here instead of the four-point function, the, the BCFT two-point function, uh, we don't expect it to have some universal piece plus order one over C corrections. And so before we can try to do some sort of perturbative counting type analysis like HPPS, uh, we must understand the sort of CFT origin, not just of these one over C corrections, but of this non-universal leading order piece. Uh, so let's begin uh, to give us some intuition by analyzing the simplest model of a wedge of empty ADS plus an end of the world brain. So here I've written down this metric. Uh, this is just the this is just the metric for empty ADS written in other coordinates. Where here, is sort of this angular radial foliation. So each slice is ADSD. This whole region in here is some piece of ADSD plus one, and there's an end of the world brain. Uh, the leading order solution will come from just solving for a free scalar field in this background. So I just solve the 
free field equation in ADS. We all know how to do that, although I'll do it maybe in different coordinates. And then I impose some boundary conditions. Say I impose some Neumann boundary condition at the brain, although it won't really matter what boundary condition I choose. Uh, so we're going to write the solution in terms of a mode expansion. Here, these uh, psi's are just the radial wave functions. And these phi's are free fields on the ADSD slices. And the, where the, the mass of this uh, free ADSD free field will depend on sort of the eigenvalue of this uh, radial wave function. Uh, in terms of this expansion, the sort of BCFT data is actually really easy to read off. Uh, going back to some early work of Aharoni et al, although I actually think the calculation there is not quite correct. Um, so here we calculate uh, this uh, bulk two point function, uh, which is becomes just sort of written in terms of the two point function of uh, the free uh, ADSD fields. Uh, and then we use the fact that if you stare at the boundary conformal block and the ADSD bulk to bulk propagator, you realize they're identical functions. And so expanding in terms of ADSD uh, two point functions is the same as actually expanding in terms of uh, boundary conformal blocks. And so you can then just read the data of the two point function by taking the boundary limit as these radii R1 and R2 go to infinity, that is, approach the boundary. Uh, you, so you already have up to some constants, the expansion in terms of conformal blocks. And so the, the boundary dimensions, the dimensions of the boundary operators are just the, given by the regular uh, ADS-CFT dictionary for, from the dimensions of these uh, ADSD fields. So this is just the dimension of one of these ADSD fields uh, in the standard dictionary. And the BOE coefficients are just come from some uh, keeping track of all of the sort of constants and making sure everything is normalized appropriately when you take this limit. So here, you know, the, the BOE coefficient is determined just in terms of some normalization of these mode functions. So CN is related to the uh, inner product of these ADSD fields, or, or, or alternatively in terms of the radial modes, depending on how you choose to push your constants around. So we can't solve for this data exactly. Uh, we don't know how to do it, uh, but we can find the asymptotic boundary operator dimensions. So one can solve asymptotically for what these mode uh, dimensions are. And this is some exact formula for those asymptotic operator dimensions. Uh, you can think about, you know, these are sort of like in, in the standard CFT pictures, these are like your double trace operators that you would build the two point function out of. Uh, that is there's some set of sort of regular spaced operators. Uh, the difference here though, is that the asymptotic spacing is not integer. It's given by this. This is the just this formula up above the, the difference between two of them. Um, so it's determined by this uh, phi b, which is just uh, a measure of sort of, of the the how the angular distance from the boundary to the brain. So the the uh, yeah the, the the asymptotic separation of all of these states is determined by the brain location. Uh, as well as the asymptotic scaling of the boundary operator expansion coefficients. So again, they're really just determined here by, so they depend exponentially on the separation. So uh, one lesson we can draw from this is that we see the bulk brain in the BCFT in terms of the asymptotic spacing of boundary operators in terms of the, the spacing of these dimensions. Uh, but it doesn't really answer the question that I would like, which is what, you know, what is the CFT meaning of this data and where does it come from? So, sorry, Jamie, quick question. I, I missed uh, asymptotic in, in what sense here? Uh, so at large, at large N, so at large dimension. So there's a, there, you know, we have this mode expansion. I'm now asking about the, the largest eigenvalues. The largest uh, ADSD masses, and this is asymptotic so, in the sense where n is much bigger than any other parameter in the problem, like the central charge, etc. Or um, no, just n. No, just n going large. Okay, so n much greater than one, but say much smaller. N, yeah. Than one, for example. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Indeed. 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 For sure. We're we're going to be thinking. I mean, you know. This is sort of a some sort of semi-classical effective field theory calculation, so we should always be thinking we're working in the regime where these operators, in the same way we would in in, a, in the regular CFT case, we think about the double trace operators 
right. can think about the That's asymptotics it. of the double trace operators at large um, n meaning like where they're uh, where it's you know they're two delta plus two n dimension. Yeah. And this is telling us say about you know well yeah these are telling us sort of about all of the, the semi classical physics of all of the you know bound states of all of the low energy operators. Thanks. Uh, so in order to understand the CFT meaning, I'd like to think a little bit about sort of some uh, a Lorentzian picture. And the question I'll ask is where do we expect the CFT two point function to become singular after continuing to real time? From the CFT, we expect it to be singular just sort of along the, the standard uh, CFT light cone. So here I've drawn an operator, I'm, I've inserted, here's the boundary and you know, I can just draw the, uh, the null rays coming off from this and bouncing off the boundary. And so this is where I expect the CFT two point function to be singular if I insert an operator along this dotted line. But from the bulk, uh, in addition to this light cone, I can send light rays, null rays into the boundary, so into the bulk, and they'll bounce off this end of the world brain and, uh, and come back to the CFT. And they don't necessarily come back along this sort of gray dotted line I drew uh, here. They can come back earlier, say, if the brain is very close to the boundary, or they can come back later, say, if the brain is sort of deeper into the bulk. So there seems to be uh, predicted by the bulk sort of new singularities in the two-point function that are not expected from the CFT. So we can directly check this is the case. So you could just solve for the bulk geodesics that go into the bulk and reflect off the brain and plot when they return to the boundary. So here's the plot of that. Um, so here I just, as an angular coordinate on my CFT, uh, the brain sort of comes and meets the CFT at either end here. And the regular sort of light cone of the CFT is sort of the edges of these triangle, so of these diamonds, and each curve I'm drawing is just for a different brain tension. So you can see that uh, we have uh, the expectable. Well, this is where the light rays return, and so we might expect, if we're given some tension, that this the CFT would have some singularity predicted by the uh, sort of semi-classical theory along, say, a curve like this. Uh, you can then uh, you find the geodesics, they return uh, on curves a fixed cross ratio. So each of these curves is determined by a cross ratio in the CFTC, which is just sine squared of this angular coordinate phi b, where the brain lies in the bulk. Uh, so you said the semi classical bulk suggests singularities in the two point function that are new and unexpected from the sort of naive predictions of the, the BCFT. And so you know, want to know how do we think about these singularities? And the answer maybe you'll guess since I kind of alluded to this earlier in the talk is the same way we think about singularities from bulk interactions uh, in ADS and the holographic CFT uh, in the sort of looking for a bulk point story of Malvasina et al. So there, bulk interactions generate new Lorentzian singularities in the CFT four point function. So for example, I, you know, I insert two operators in the CFT that send uh, something into the bulk, they interact locally in the bulk and come back out to the boundary. And so there's, you know, there's some, some Landau diagram one can draw in the bulk, which predicts some singularity in the CFT here. Uh, but this is not a, a CFT singularity you'd predict from a, a boundary Landau diagram. And so, you know, in that picture, there was some bulk point singularity uh, in some place where there was not uh, a naive prediction of a, of a singularity in the CFT. And so in the bulk point story, we find this divergence comes from summing over an infinite tower of double trace operators whose dimensions are integer spaced. Uh, and the integer spacing means that when we do this analytic continuation, all the phases line up to give you this divergence. Uh, of course, it's not expected to be a true divergence of the CFT correlator. So expect the spacing to break down when we reach a scale at which the bulk becomes non-local, we reach the scale of the gap. And so this is you know, not really a true singularity, but some sort of resonance in the, the CFT correlator, which is sort of a hallmark of there being some you know, bulk description. So let's sort of translate this story to the holographic BCFT case. Uh, the semi-classical bulk and brain should predict a new singularity in the BCFT. So we'll see this through alignment of phases of these our asymptotics and our semi-classical operators when we analytically continue. Uh, and of course, in, in the full BCFT calculation, we'll expect, again, it's just a resonance. So above the gap, these operator dimensions can no longer align. 
And we're now seeing that the brain is not sort of, you know, some infinitely thin local brain, but it, you know, it has some width, right? You know, it, it's not infinitely thin and infinitely local. So can we check this works? Oh, okay, I didn't quite animate that properly. So uh, let's work in local coordinate, sorry, let's work in radial coordinates. So I'm gonna express this cross field C in terms of some new variable rho. In terms of this variable rho, this whole region I'm interested in here to the future of this point uh, is mapped to different points on the unit circle. So the naive sort of first light tone you'd reach is at rho equals one. As you go um, into this, the future of this point, you go through cross ratios that are like rho e to the i theta. And when you come out to the sort of reflected null right here, you're at rho equals minus one. So in these coordinates, our null rays return to the boundary along some curve, which is just given uh, very nicely in terms of this angular coordinate uh, phi that we talked about. So that's actually quite nice. The sort of angular coordinate really becomes the, the angle of the cross ratio. Uh, and then we see uh, when we expand the boundary conformal blocks in radial coordinates and at large dimension, they're just, they roughly go like rho to the delta. And so if we plug in our formula for our dimensions, our asymptotic dimensions we calculated, we find that these different, uh, you know, sort of double trace type operators uh, are all separated by e to the i two pi n. And so they're exactly at this point phi b, their phases all line up. And so they all sort of add coherently. So the, the phases are blocked up exactly as desired to give some uh, divergence. Uh, I'll say this is not just a story about empty ADS plus an end of the world brain. So whenever the bulk has a good causal structure, the semi-classical theory will predict new bulk, uh, new bulk singularities in the two-point function of light operators. Um, and you know, if you wanted to sort of have a mental picture in mind, you can sort of imagine this story where you know we have this sort of the geometry that caps off smoothly. Say we have some circle, so it's kind of like you know they have like a, sort of like the extra dimension kind of looks like a cigar that pinches off. And um, when we're looking at the, of course the the causal structure uh, of the low energy fields. We're just picking some sort of you know finite asymptotic momentum mode on this cigar, and so as we sort of go to infinite momentum to see the the null structure in the bulk, we we probe uh, sort of a, a universal causal structure of the, of the base theory, and so no matter no matter whether the geometry has a, you know an end of the world brain or extra dimensions, um, there's always going to be some singular structure, which is really just telling you about if you send a probe in, how long it takes to go in and come back again to the boundary. And so what I want to say is that the moral of the story is that uh, a, a holographic BCFD has a, a causal structure that's encoded in the asymptotic spacing of double trace operators. Of course, we don't expect that this to be regular at scales higher than the gap, but it's you know, regular in this regime of validity of the semi-classical theory. Uh, but the important thing is that nothing fixes this careful alignment in the boundary conformal field theory, as far as we could determine. So even when the CFD is holographic, so we found no simpler condition that enforces the spacing other than just saying that you want the spacing to be there. Uh, in the same way um, uh, that if you want to talk about a, a holographic CFT uh, in the sort of HPPS, something you, you had to assume largely set factorization. You had to assume that you had this uh, mean field theory solution uh, to begin with and that it was not uh, something that was determined by some other constraint on the CFT. And so, as I said, yeah, we, we have to assume the relevant uh, mean field theory that determines our gravitational causal structure. And furthermore, that uh, all low energy fields have to agree on the same causal structure. And so I think this should lead us to conclude is that holographic BCFTs are sparse among all possible boundary conditions for a holographic CFT that this very careful alignment of double trace operators that gives us a good causal structure uh, is not at all generic, is not uh, typical of a BCFT, but is an input we have to put in. And I see I'm essentially out of time. So having said that, let me just give you a few open questions related to this, uh, or a few, and there's many, but a few that I think are interesting. So 
you know, ha having understood this leading order two point function, what we'd like to do is repeat the analysis of HPPS and try to understand if we can match, give, give, you know, given a, a, a valid mean field theory leading order solution, can we match the perturbative corrections on both sides? And so this is something we're working on right now. Um, it would also be nice to find holographic CFTs with boundary conditions that don't satisfy the regular asymptotic spacing. So I've argued there's nothing in the CFT that constrains the spacing to happen, uh, but good evidence for that would be to find lots of examples that violate it. Uh, it'd also be very interesting to think about sort of modern bootstrap techniques that sort of make use of sort of, sort of you know sort of polyclad regi blocks blocks um, that sort of sum over you know exactly some infinite tower of boundary operators with integer space dimension. Uh, and so it'd be interesting to know whether there's a role to be played by these new sort of mean field theory solutions uh, in these sort of analytic bootstrap techniques, where instead of sort of summing over integer spaced operators in the BCFT, you sum over all these other different spacings and whether one can uh, do interesting bootstrap studies with them. And so I see them out of time. So let me stop here. Thanks a lot for the interesting talk. Let's thank Jamie. And the possibility we could take still several questions. Does anyone would like to ask some questions? So Jamie, um, thanks for, for, for this talk. Uh, I would like to ask a question because the, the these works are partly uh, motivated by the islands uh, program, but uh, as far as I can see, like you did not really reference uh, to this. So, like, is there some lesson uh, for the islands program coming uh, from your considerations that can be directly applied? Um, I mean, so if you if you thought in the islands calculation that you could take a CFT and an arbitrary boundary condition. And that it would be described by a, you know, something, you know, it'd be, it'd be described by this the CFT coupled to some brain, you know, that would not be correct. But that there's nothing wrong with building these models as long as you're assuming that you've chosen one of these very sparse examples. So the, the statement is not that there's no such thing as a, a, a you know, the sort of end of the world brain picture for a BCFT, but just that they're very rare. In this, in, in in the exactly or in a very analogous way to the fact that uh, you know a holographic CFT is very rare. You can't just choose an arbitrary large C CFT. You have to find one that factorizes and has a gap. Thanks. Hi there, Jamie. This that was a really nice talk. Um, I I just had a minor question about when you were motivating the new singularities, you were drawing light rays and say that said that they reflected off the brain. Yeah. Is it, did did you literally mean that they reflect, or do you mean that I can just draw two points on the boundary and they there are light rays that meet on the brain? Um. No, that they literally that, that they reflect. So it's true. You can have even more singularities if you add to interactions. Well, but it. So I know that was just motivation. But if the well, in, in if the angle is past pi by two for the brain, yeah, doesn't so you, the reflection you, send you off into the bulk somewhere? Uh, yeah, good. Yeah. So if you were, yeah, I I, I kind of glossed over this. Uh, I was assuming that we were taking uh, a boundary that cut a sphere in half. So we were working with a disk. And so uh, they always reflect back. So it's true. If, okay. if you took the angle very wide and you're working with a brain that had a, a flat, you know, a flat boundary where you were in, um, you know, this is just, you know, uh, the upper half plane, you're, you're right. Okay. Yeah. So in the, in the picture, um, Oh, wait, do you lose? Oh, maybe I killed the screen sharing there when I closed that. Let's see if it still works. Do you see my slides or did I? Yep, I see your slides again. Oh. 
So here, uh, the case, so here, the, the, the boundary in my CFT is these two red lines at, you know, theta equals zero and theta equals pi. So I've cut the boundary okay. circle in half. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, here, here it's, okay, it's in higher dimensions, but I'm just choosing some 2D slice of the boundary. And then, you know, the brain goes in uh, and returns, uh, you know, both at zero and pi. And, and so it always reflects back to the, the boundary. Okay. I, I guess I was just going to ask. I mean, in the in the other conformal frame, you're, what you're doing, what you see, is a clear distinction between positive and negative tension brains. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if what you're doing sheds any light that says, or or it it favors or says that positive tension brains are more uh, realistic than negative tension brains. Or whether yeah, I don't. Anything. I haven't seen anything that supports that distinction. Okay. I mean, I guess the only thing that's really different is when it comes back. And so I think it's the case that positive tension brains that come up back in this first quadrant here and the, the neg and when, when it's farther away from the boundary, they come back up here. And zero tension is exactly this, this case in between. Okay. But I don't, both of these seem fine to me. I, I, nothing, nothing we did suggests one is allowed or not allowed. It is is the ones that are coming back sooner? Isn't there some kind of faster than light signaling? Or yeah, I worried about this a little bit. You, that that worried me. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's to the future of this point anyway. Ah, uh, yeah, you know. yeah. So it, it's not like I mean. So it would be faster than light signaling if you thought you had to get us. Oh, let me try to draw on this. You know. Um, So you know, here is the operate. Can I draw here? No, I, I can draw here. There. So there's our operator, right? Okay. And then, so here's the sort of future of this, no, future of this operator. You know, and then you can think about, you know, if, if you thought about, you know, it actually being like a in a there's no boundary, and then there's another operator. You're certainly here. You're to the future of this operator. Mm -hmm. So that would be a little worrisome if you were. If you were getting, you know, and sometimes you're thinking it's, it's like this light ray here has been bent to down. So yeah. it seems like it would be a causal, you know, it, you know, we, I think, we, you know, we know that this thing can you seem to shift up here, but it, we don't think it can shift like this. Mm -hmm. But it's not, there's not actually an operator there. It's all, you know. It, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think maybe something that might make you feel comfortable about this is, uh, um, well, Alex May and David Wakeham have been thinking a little bit about the connection between the sort of this bulk scattering picture and quantum information about um, you know, the relationship between these types of sort of causal scattering problems and, and entanglement wedges. Mm -hmm. And there, what you see in this picture is that um, here, the sort of the, the scattering region, the entanglement wedge contains the, the brain and the bulk. Mm -hmm. And so sort of using this region, then it suggests you can find out information about the brain and the boundary, even though say you, you can't actually send a message along the boundary that goes all the way to the boundary and comes back again. Mm. So it says that sort of, you know, using entanglement, you know, you, you, can, you can reconstruct the brain, even if you can't send causal messages in the CFT that go to the brain and come back again. And so maybe that's one way to think about this. I mean, I, I think it's probably also important is that we're not seeing some true singularity, but we're just seeing a resonance, which maybe should make yeah. one feel happier. You know, if, if we saw an actual singularity in the CFT here, I'd be worried. The fact that it's just some resonance that's sort of indicative of sort of a, a fake, you know, bulk CFT singularity makes me feel more comfortable about that. Okay. That was a really nice talk. Thanks. Thank you. Does anyone else have some question to ask? Yeah, uh, I have a kind of related question. Mm -hmm. So um, it's about the, the analogy with the bulk point singularity. So I guess mm -hmm. singularities and CFT correlators can arise for different reasons. 
One is that there's a bulk interaction like a lambda phi to the fourth that would give you the bulk point singularity. And the other is because the background has changed in the bulk. And so, you know, geodesics pr propagate on different ways and then they reach the boundary in different ways. Yeah. And that can also lead to a singularity. Uh, it seems to me that, that your type of singularities are more of the second kind. Yeah, that's definitely true. So, I mean, I guess the thing is that people haven't done a CFT analysis of that second kind because it's very hard. Right. I guess, and, and so I use the analogy more to the, interact, to the interaction story because that's the thing that's been done in CFTs before. Um, I guess one thing you could say that this is kind of, you know, a nice example of that second type where, um, you know, generically in the CFT, we can't solve, it's, it's hard to see the causal structure of the CFT in terms of, uh, sort of the bulk in terms of the CFT four point function, just because, you know, there's, there's not a lot of symmetry to help you. Here we have some sort of nice middle ground where we have a lot of symmetry. We have this full SOD one but it's not enough to uniquely fix the geometry. And so we can do some of these studies where we sort of combine both. We have some non-trivial background that we can look at the causal structure of, as well as a lot of symmetry to help us solve the problem. I see. Uh, I, mean, I, I should also say that there's, uh, I did mention this work by uh, Netta, uh, Netta Engelhardt and I guess Gary Horowitz, where you know they, they also talk about using CFT correlators to uh, uncover the, the causal structure of the bulk. So looking for these resonances and CFT correlators and then using that as a way to actually determine the causal structure of the bulk. And so this is you know, obviously very closely related to that story as well. Yeah, the, the reason I'm, I'm asking is that, you know, you could try to play the same game in say thermal two point functions and ask, you know, uh, on general grounds, when do I see certain singularities in thermal two point functions in the CFT? And, you know, from there try to derive some conditions, um, but it seems to me that they would be much more complicated conditions than what you would ask for four point functions in the vacuum. And so I guess you're saying there's some middle ground here, but I'm trying to understand how, how much is it to ask to even have this mean field theory um, solution to start with? Because that's kind of what you need to reproduce the, the causal structure, right? Yeah, so you're saying how, how hard is it to get the mean field theory? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we actually we spent a, a lot of time trying to derive this mean field theory. So okay, I mean, the, the conclusion of my talk was that uh, BCFTs with holographic duals are sparse, even when the CFT has a holographic dual. You know, but at first, that wasn't what we were aiming for. We tried to, you know, we, we looked at the, these asymptotic dimensions and then tried to find something like you know uh, the, the the boundary central charge or some other thing. That you, if you, if you say, if you said, like, I had a gap and a boundary central charge, could I use this data to show that I had this asymptotic spacing or something like that? Mm -hmm. But we were, okay, I mean, we, we were not successful. We couldn't find any constraint. And so then we, we realized maybe we were looking for the wrong thing, uh, that, th that just there was no constraint. This was very special. And that actually is very familiar. It's very special in the way we were familiar that large C factorization was special and you just had to assume it. Um, Yeah, and so I, I think, you know, the, the conclusion we have is that they're they're very rare and sparse. I mean, I would like to go and find some nice counterexamples to make me more comfortable with that conclusion. Uh, you know, I guess at some level that's a bit of it's a bit of a conjecture. Um, and, and you know, it could maybe maybe some other smart person will realize that there is some other simpler set of things one can assume, which then results in that uh, the conclusion. And so it, maybe it's not quite as sparse as we're saying. I'm not sure. Is the worry that a typical brain will also turn on all your low energy matter fields? Is that the problem or is that yet? No, that, that, that would be fine. So the types of, this spacing is really, no, this spacing of operators is a diagnostic of there being a good causal structure in the bulk. And so it doesn't matter if that bulk is a, just a brain plus empty ADS or a brain plus a back reacted ADS or some non-trivial higher dimensional geometry fibered over ADS that you know, caps off smoothly. All of these have a causal structure. And so all of them, the light fields have to see, you know, the, you know, the, the sort of, yeah, when you, when you look at the, the null, when you look at the causal structure as probed by these light fields, they all see the same thing. And so they all have to have this spacing. Thanks, it was a nice talk. <laughs>
Thank you. And let's thank Jamie again. I will now stop the recording.